Thanks for joining us again. We're continuing in our study of the parables, where Jesus tells stories. He tells stories, he lays these stories down. The idea is laying a story down next to a truth. And he tells these stories, or parables, to help illustrate the idea of his spiritual kingdom. In our last recording, we were in Luke chapter 15, and again, this recording... This recording is the third of three lost ones. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and in this video, the lost son. It's commonly referred to as the prodigal son. And before we get get into our lesson, we have to understand what prodigal means. Because there's a lot of younger folks who have no idea about the song or what prodigal means. Prodigal means someone who is recklessly extravagant, someone who can't afford to be extravagant and wasteful in their spending. It's characterized by a lavish, yielding, be willing to spend any amount on anything that pleases them. And that's the story of the lost son. These parables, all three of these parables, were designed to tell us about our Father's love. We'll talk about the setting in just a minute. This is a rather long reading, but follow along as we read in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. Jesus told them another story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, This younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he fully came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough and to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he's found. Most folks know this story. This is a wonderful story. It is a heartwarming story. But it's also a challenging story because of the setting. The setting of all three of these lost ones parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son now, is at a time when tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus. They heard his compassion. They heard the gospel of being welcomed into the kingdom being welcomed into a kingdom in God 
at a time when they were not welcomed by their religious leaders, and the Pharisees and scribes were murmuring. They were murmuring about Jesus and him eating with folks like these, sinners. It wasn't that the scorn of the, of the scribes and the Pharisees weren't known. It was known these tax collectors and sinners were religious outcasts and unwelcome in their presence. Their terrible attitudes are being challenged here in these three. In the lost sheep and the lost coin, it's not as evident. But in this third story that Jesus lays down, their terrible attitudes are going to be challenged by Jesus, and he is going to show them the error of their thoughts and their attitudes and their actions toward these tax collectors and sinners who would draw near to God as they are being drawn near to Jesus and his teaching. The setting is obvious in that the Father symbolizes our Heavenly Father. It would be interesting to go back and to try to talk to the scribes and Pharisees and ask them what they thought about God. He would obviously be a judgmental God, but certainly not judgmental toward them. Certainly judgmental toward all the other sinners. The prodigal son in coming home represents a penitent sinner like the tax collectors and sinners these self-righteous people are perturbed with, as we talked about in our last recording. Now, the odd character here and the diff uh, another level of instruction that Jesus lays down here in this parable is the older son, the older brother. Because the older brother is reflecting the attitude of these Pharisees and scribes in the present time. And as he's talking to them, here is this older brother who refuses. He refuses to accept the repentance of someone who is an obvious sinner. An obvious one who has run off and done abominable things. Terrible things. In the parable of the lost son, we see their bad attitude. And we see the Father's instruction. At this point, Jesus is not overly emphasizing how wrong they are, but he is emphasizing that they're wrong. And one of the other lessons that we look at here is our Heavenly Father loves his children. He loves even the lost ones. And apparently here is a major point of understanding. A point of understanding for the Pharisees and the, and the scribes who were murmuring against him, and a point for us. God loves even the lost ones. Even when they turn away from him, his heart yearns for them to be home. The joy expressed, if you look back in Luke chapter 15, at the joy expressed in verse 7, there was joy in heaven when the shepherd found his lost sheep. There is joy even in the presence of angels of God in verse 10 when the widow found the lost coin. And now in verse 32, in, in the parable of the lost son, the father looks at his older brother who has a bad attitude toward his younger brother. Now, what, what the, it's interesting that what the father doesn't do the father doesn't say, you're wrong. But the father wasn't embarrassed by the younger son's sins. He longed for him to come home, and when he came home, the father rejoiced. And he says in verse 32, it's right that we had this party for him. It's right that we are rejoicing. You see, there is rejoicing on the part of God when sinners come to repentance. There is joy there. Not embarrassment. Not trying to make you feel bad for what you've done. You've already felt bad because you've repented and come back to the Father. Our Heavenly Father loves His children, even the lost ones. If faithful children of God now need to understand, as faithful children of God, we need to understand the proper way to think about and receive these lost ones. Certainly, sin is awful. And Jesus would have been the last person to diminish sin since he died as a sacrifice for it. But we can't let our anger 
no matter how bad others' sins are, change the way that we think about them or change the way that we love them. When they are gone from the Father's house, the Father yearns for them to come home. And if we live in the Father's house, we should probably adopt the Father's character along that line. And when they return, we rejoice. Not to have a sibling rivalry or sibling jealousy because they're getting some attention from the Father that we aren't. The Father loved the older, the older brother and always had. Why do we receive folks like this? Because we're supposed to love like the Father. If we're going to be God's people, we're supposed to be God-like, godly. If we're going to be Christians, we're supposed to be Christian, which means like Christ. Faithful children of God now, faithful people of God now, are supposed to love others like our God does. And this is an obvious lesson. An obvious lesson from this story. And I'm, I'm afraid that maybe what has happened through the years is this parable has become too common, too accepted. That we don't appreciate just how different this teaching was by Jesus. Just how challenging this was unless you've been around self-righteous people. Because one thing that self-righteous people always do is they look down on others. They diminish others as if they believe the lie that by diminishing others it elevates them. In the Father's house, the Father loves us all. There are some other lessons that we can look at too here in this understanding that give us even larger principles. We are free to choose. God gave us all the ability to make choices. And it starts even in the garden. In Genesis chapter 2, God gave us free will. He gave us the choice to either listen to Him and obey or not. Even at the end of the conquest of Canaan in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua looked at Israel and said, Choose this day whom you will serve. Now this is a generation who has lived off of God's grace and God's protection and God's power. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. You've got a choice to make. We are free to choose whether we're going to believe in God and serve God or not. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. Well, of course we should love him. But it's clear from this parable that there is a principle involved here that God allows his children to make a choice. He even allowed this young man to leave the house. Now, imagine that. The, the younger son is basically looking at the father and saying, I wish you were dead so I could have the money that was coming to me. The money that was coming to him, if there were only two sons, would be one-third of the father's inheritance. One-third of the estate. I wish you were dead because I want to live like I want to live. Because the younger son knew he couldn't stay in the house and live like he wanted to live. The father was not going to allow prostitutes and gross partying like this. And so he basically told the father, I wish you were dead so I could live my life. Sounds like a petulant teenager which is a perfect representation of us when we rebel against God. God says, you, are, you have the freedom to choose, but understand your choices have consequences. Riotous living has its cost. Even in verse 13, it's called a waste. Wasteful living, prodigal living. This extravagantly wasteful idea. Now, what's interesting is, God knows how to throw a party. The father threw a party for the child when he came home. It wasn't the fact that there was no fun, that there was no merriment, that there was no joy in the house. There was joy in the house, but it just wasn't the type of fun that the younger one had. And if we decide to choose that way, we need to understand its costs. This type of living, riotous living, not only is wasteful, because as soon as the money is gone, so is the fun. But it also separates us from our Father. 
the younger son was willing to be separated from everyone who had ever loved him in his life and thought that someone else out there would love me more when I'm having fun. What riotous living also does is it causes us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. Now, those of us who live now in a Gentile Western culture, we eat pork all the time. A good Jewish boy having to feed the pigs, the cost of riotous living was an abomination. That he, he would even conscience the idea of feeding pigs. And that he would even consider eating what the pigs were eating. Sin and riotous living will take us much further away from our God than we could ever begin to imagine. <clears throat> when you think of the sins that the prodigal, that the, the lost one probably did in the story behind the scenes, drunkenness and sexual sins and maybe now <clears throat> drugs and, and who knows, shameful Because he wanted to live. Because he thought in the Father's house he couldn't live as well. There are consequences because the only way back into the Father's house is through real humility and through real repentance. Any sort of rebellion, any sort of sin, any sort of bad attitude, we must repent because of our rebellion against God. And it seems to point to the fact that at one point or another in, in our lives, we have been tempted to be and act like either the lost son or the older son with the bad attitude. And really, honestly, neither one of them sounds very good right now. The prodigal wanted his way of sin and corruption. But yet the older brother had a view of life that was apparently faulty. And it wasn't just in these three stories, but in other, in other stories where these Pharisees and scribes who were closer to God, obviously, they believed in God. They tried to stay morally and ethically pure. They prayed and worshipped. They tried to be religiously faithful. But what's interesting is they didn't think they were as much in need of the Father's grace as those who were lost. And here is the truth. Both sons needed the grace of the Father. And the older son was just as selfish, just as unloving, because he thought his goodness warranted his joy. What he had done and what he was continuing to do, slaving in the father's house, warranted some party, some acknowledgement. He was blinded by his own, quote, goodness, unquote. I have never disobeyed you. I have never wasted your money. You see, that's that same sort of self-righteous attitude. It might be argued and argued effectively that the older son was just as lost as the younger son without leaving the father's house. But the real point of the story is the father is willing to forgive. Not only th this beautiful picture of a father who sees his lost son coming from a long way. And, and in this story, even as you read it, you see the love of the father as he's running out toward this lost son who is coming home. He's nasty. He's filthy. He doesn't even hardly look like his son anymore, but the father doesn't care. It's almost like he even interrupts his son as he is repeating his repentance. He's not even listening to him because all he cares about is that his son is home. All he cares about is the one who he thought probably was dead was home. But not only was the father willing to forgive the lost one, do you remember who else the father went to? You have the spoiled brat, murmuring, whiny older brother who's refusing to come to the family feast, who's refusing to come to the family party, who's refusing to celebrate the fact that his younger brother, who everybody thought was dead, it's almost as if the older brother is saying, well, I wish he were still dead. 
And the Father's willing to go out to him too. Because the Father's willing even to forgive him. The Father is willing to forgive. I wonder if that's something that's been said so often that, that, that this has lost its power as well. Our Father is willing to forgive. As we come to the close of this recording, there is something that we should understand. We shouldn't believe the lie. We should not be so embarrassed by our sin that we believe the lie that our Father could not love us any longer. That's a lie. No matter what sin. One truth is, none of us are worthy of God's grace, except the fact that He says we are. None of us have earned God's grace. None of us in our church going, in our Bible reading, in our moral and ethically pureness, which is not true. From the self-righteous church member who would never miss a church service, but has bad attitudes toward people, all the way back to the folks who are rebellious and wandering, whoremongering and drug addicted, God loves us and is not so embarrassed by our sin. We should be embarrassed, but embarrassed enough to want to be willing to repent. He's looking for us to come home. He's looking for us to come back to Him. And He will greet us with joy when we repent. When we make our way back, when we trust Him enough to remember His love and accept His love and grace, He's willing to accept us. That's the story of the lost son. That's the story the Pharisees and the scribes needed to hear. Not just the fact that the lost ones, these tax collectors and scribes, who they thought were beneath them, were welcome in the kingdom, but even these people, even the Pharisees and the scribes with their terrible attitudes toward other people, they were welcome in God's presence as well. And that they needed to change the way that they thought about others. In the parable of the lost ones, we understand that God rejoices when sinners come to repentance. We also should understand that we shouldn't make any barriers that God didn't make by welcoming others into the kingdom. If there is some way, some help that we can offer you, some instruction, some prayer, some way that we can help you back into the Father's kingdom, please know the truth that God does love you. And you should not be so embarrassed by your sin that you believe the lie of our adversary that says God surely couldn't love me. He not only can, He does. And if there's any way that we can help, we would ask in some way that you would reach out to us and let us be a help to you in understanding the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He certainly did die for all sinners, which includes the self-righteous, even to the rebellious. And He longs for us to be at home with Him. Thanks for joining.